Hey all, Matt here. I uh, got another commentary track for you. Um, I'm using a new recording device this time, a new recording program, and uh, unbeknownst to me, it captures all the sound coming from your computer, not just Skype. So you're going to hear the uh, audio from the episode as well as us talking, but I think it worked out okay. I think it actually, the levels are fine. You can hear the people talking and you can hear the episode underneath it. So, um, yeah, enjoy this, and we'll be back with another eventually. Uh, <laughs> we're back for another commentary. This time we're going to do episode 14, I believe, judging by our previous conversations. But I can never keep track of the episode numbers just because of that weird system they use. But is it 14? It's 14 to me. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with that. It's, it's, the, it's the one where Maddie dies. Spoilers. Um Okay, so uh, this is our next uh, Lynch-directed episode. And, um, yeah, we're all queued up. If you're all queued up at home, we'll go... We'll press play on the count. We'll go one, two, three, play. Okay. One, two, three, play. I stood where that branch was. (laughs) (laughs) I've also met met that branch. (laughs) Yes. The most interesting branch in the world. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that was one of the my favorite parts of going to the fest last year was seeing the branch because it's such a stupid thing, but it's amazing. <laughs> well, it's just amazing that it's still there. Like a lot of trees die. Yeah. Within you know a few decades, or get cut down or whatever. <clears throat> so. I think we may have talked about this before, but all the atmospheric shots of the, uh, the town and the surrounding area, did, did, did Lynch do those, or were those uh, Ron Garcia? Uh, some... Ron Garcia did most of them, Okay, I think, at least for the series. Do we know if he's back for this new series? He's no. not. He's not back? Yep. He's not back in the new series. Ah, oh, well, I'm I, I'm sure Lynch can get some great shots too. But that's one of my favorite things about the show is just I could just, I, in fact, I do that sometimes. I just put the, on the atmospherics, uh, the like the nature ones from the Blu-ray, and just leave them on for a while. Yeah, it is great. And they pulled from them throughout the whole series. You know, Ron went up there and did a whole bunch of them. And... Mm. This is a great opening. Well, again, you know, when we were talking about the straight story, here's an an amazing opening shot. I mean, you've got them all standing there in a line, and it's not a shot that you would normally see on television because it's far back, you don't have a close-up. It's a Lynch shot. Yeah. Oh, completely. Yeah. Is Lynch, like, the only director in the series that really did that, where he he would have a a large uh, ensemble shot or just a shot from far out, and he'd just hold there and let people act like it's a play? Pretty much. (laughs) He's he's, kind of something that he does. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) It's almost like a shot you would see in, like, a a 1950s show or something. Donna Hayward spoke of her... Another thing that he does, too, is that he he likes to do wide-angle lenses, sometimes even on closer shots. Yeah, you know what you dig up. So, but this is definitely one of his uh, Gordon, I ones here. Well, and part of it is is that he was a painter first, and to me, that's a painting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. I mean, what you're really looking at, even with the, you know, the way he's got the fake plant stage there, normal people would be like, "Oh, zoom in, that looks awful." And I'm sure he's like, "No, no, no, zoom out, <laughs> that looks awful." <laughs> it kind of makes me sad that, that this is in four by three, and we we got those black bars on the sides. We sure. can't, you know, it's not widescreen. Thanks. A shot like this also gives you incredible detail with the set design. I just love how you can look into all the different corners and see such intense detail. Yeah. I also yeah. think that, isn't it true that this is the only episode that's written by Mark Frost and directed by David Lynch? Uh, not, uh, on its not, own. Not no. co? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, yeah, Not co? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is good. But how much did Lynch change, I wonder, like he did with the final bit. episode? He changed some, and not, as, not anywhere close to the final episode, but he definitely made changes and... Uh, Threw things in for sure. Mm. Such as the tennis balls. Yeah. Well, the, ha, 
I think I heard that that had been a, a running gag between directors as they would try to put like crazier and crazier things in the background of the Great Northern. Is that true? Yes. Wes Lincoln Gladder started it in episode five. <laughs> so did David Lynch win there? Is that the weirdest? <laughs> he probably so, won. <laughs> I, I... My experts here, I, I recently had an argument with David Bushman about this scene that's coming up here, um, about Ben Horn, you know, coming here and the one-armed man having this thing. I submit this is a coincidence. Why do you think, do you think it has anything to do with Ben Horn walking into the room? It's just to no. throw you off, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it has any, it's not connected. Yeah, that's what yeah. I think, too. Because he said, well, that Mike was wrong here. And I'm like, no, 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 this is a red herring. Yeah. He just... Oh, absolutely. Okay, that's what I thought. Mike must yeah, need Mike his medication says, or something. Yeah, Mike never says that's him over there. He never directly... He just passes out and starts convulsing. Yeah. And what, what I never understood is how come Mike doesn't know who Bob is anymore when he did in Fire Walk With Me. That's the only inconsistency. I think he has kind of a code, like the giant. I mean, Cooper asked yeah. the giant, who is Bob? And he said, I, I can't tell you. I, I think there's some weird <laughs> weird book of rules in the Black Lodge that they can't out each other hmm. uh, to law enforcement. What do you guys yeah, think? I, I tend to agree with that. There's definitely some set of rules that they can't directly say things. Mm. Um, I think that if Gerard, you know, saw Leland, he may have a reaction. Zula Montana. What, do you, were you guys, when you first saw this, were you sad to see Harold go? No. No? I was. I love, I love Harold's story arc, but he freaked me out so bad when he, ra- he rakes his face yeah. that I was kind of glad he was gone, because after mm. that I was really scared of him. Mm. That, that was one point where they're raking the face where Blu-ray is, was an unfortunate thing for them. Mm. Yeah, you can see the, the little paint dab on his face before yes. he actually breaks it down. But you know, I could I always saw that before. I feel like maybe it was on DVD, but I've certainly yeah. known about that. Um, so this is another shot that I want to talk about. I feel like in episode 14, you know, everyone's going to talk about the final shot in the roadhouse I would submit this is this is the best shot it's in this entire yeah. in the entire episode. It's and interesting. This is great. This is, um, great. this is similar to the straight story in a way, in the in the way that it moves slowly and moves around, and it's a one it's one shot. Yeah, and you scene. and you you are following the story. And what I really love about this shot, that to me is is just so Lynch, is he does not he he plays the whole song of Louis Armstrong. Um, it's a wonderful world. Is that what it's called? I think yes. so. Um, oh, what a wonderful world! Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful world! Yeah, exactly. I think that's what Sam put. Song just called "What a Wonderful World." Sorry. And um, he cuts it before the last line, and yet you hear this whole song. But I just love that. <laughs> and and like I said, a normal director would be like, "Well, let's finish the song. There's five seconds left." Mm-hmm. And shots out, boom! You don't hear the end. Every time I hear the song on the radio or anything, I always pick, I always think the song's going to cut out right then. For some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is, out. this is a hard version to find, too. I really had to search to get this live version because I wanted to have it. Me, too. <laughs> I eventually found it, but it was definitely a tough find with the whole intro. Yeah. So yeah. She has to think about herself. I love this going behind the tape recorder. I mean, the tape recorder, the uh, record player, because it's great, uh, you'll, you'll great foreshadowing. Back, also, how many carpets are we going to see in the new series? No one has carpet anymore. <laughs> 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 carpets are scary in this series. Well, it's all, I think Richard Hoover must have bought like a huge, massive amount of mauve carpet because that's the only kind of carpet in the series, uh, at least on the sets. Yeah, and it's so, about you know. He loves that David Lynch loves that mauve color anyway. I mean, you know, he left the walls and Dorothy Valens apart. Poor Audrey, she just lost the character. Lost her way, you know. Once she gets out of One Eyed Jacks, they really just didn't have much to do with her. I know that kind of stems to the whole Cooper and Audrey mm. uh, debate that will never die. But uh, it is a shame because Audrey was such a powerful character. But you know, right after this time, I, I just wasn't really ever a fan of what they did with her. Yeah. Uh, they had to kind of take a different tactic from what they were planning. Ask you some 
Well, and this is a good time for me to promote my interview with Sherilyn Fenn that's out at the Red Room podcast now. And we did discuss this. I asked her about her feeling about her and Cooper getting together. And and she certainly is passionate about it. <laughs> well, Audrey was a great sort of junior detective in those first two episodes. And as I was rewatching it this last time, it was it just felt like such a blown opportunity to not have her keep that detective uh, thing going on. Mm -hmm. She asked if she could work in the department store. Well, she was a really... Go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, the last real reference we get to that is with uh, Denise Bryce and the... uh, They have women agents, more or less. That bit is kind of the... The last bit we get with kind of her... And stealing the pictures from Ben is kind of the last real detective thing we get. Then as soon as Ben gets into Civil War mode, it's kind of... That's kind of over at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you... Well, she was just a really powerful female character, and especially at a time where that wasn't happening, especially for younger women. So I think she they created her as a really strong character, but just didn't keep it going. This is a great scene for Richard Beamer. Beamer, Beamer. Yeah. I could have sworn I just saw a picture of James Hurley on his motorcycle to the far left of the screen. I'm going to have to go back and look. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be really weird. Well, Ben had yeah. sex with a lot of people in town. We don't know. Yep. <laughs> James was always hanging out with Laura. Some one night he tagged along. Yeah, we don't know when she visited Ben. <laughs> so I actually never thought Ben did it. I I I never went down that path. Did do you guys remember who you uh, thought did it at the time? Or I don't think I thought him either. I thought it was too. It would have been too obvious. I thought, I thought the same thing. Anyone who was established to be villain, I was like, no, they didn't do it. <laughs> I love this cue uh, from Angelo. I guess it's not really a cue, it's a song, but it's Shelley on the second season soundtrack, and it's just a wonderful track. It's it truly great. is. It's possibly my favorite, along with maybe Sycamore Trees. Oh, yeah. They never released the actual Does... TV version, though, because oh. the version that's on the soundtrack is a little bit different. It has more uh, instrumentation on it. Is this the first time in the series they play the Shelley theme? Yes. Just for a little while. And... Yeah, so wh- what I remember about, I actually remember watching this episode as it aired. And they had ran an ad in the USA Today that said, tonight you'll find out who killed her really. <laughs> and I already knew that Twin Peaks ratings were dying and I was fearful for the show and I was excited. I thought, okay, this episode is really going to kick ass and everyone's going to tune in. And then they have this scene, mm. which is a great match and scene, but this is not going to bring viewers back. And there's a couple other scenes in this episode that um, I wish they would have packed full of the, this episode. Do you guys feel that way, or do you have any memory of that? Yes. Like, being I, I just remember being, like, t- completely terrified, but exciting, excited, because you knew you were going to find out who killed her, and you and I was, I'm still terrified of Bob, and I knew he just had to play into it. So, I just had this feeling of existential dread. Um, yes. I remember, I went out to eat with my parents or something before it came on, and all I could think about was just... Who killed Laura Palmer and getting home to watch it? It was really exciting. I remember this very similar feeling, just being feeling that sense of dread that only David Lynch can instill in you when you're watching one of his uh, works for the first time. He can do it the way no other can. Yeah. Well, in the end, is is phenomenal. It's just I didn't think scenes like this would make someone who just tuned in necessarily to come back. But. I wonder what David Lynch thought of this storyline. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people will dog Nadine's, uh, you know, little trip as a high school girl, but really, since Twin Peaks, Lynch has worked in people sort of losing their their own identity. It, to me, it feels completely Lynchian. What a care! I actually like this storyline. <laughs> Honestly, it's never bothered me as much as some of the other things in season two. I mean, I, it doesn't bother me. Yeah, I love her and Mike together. <laughs> They're hilarious. Well, you see, the Hinkmans. <laughs> yeah. Your parents drag you off to Europe or someplace for a month, and 
when you get back, it's like you've been away forever. This is the only time that David Lynch directs uh, Two chocolate shakes Teenage Nadine Nadine here. Coffee for me. The only time he directs who? Extra whipped cream on Teenage me. Nadine. Oh, Teenage Nadine. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. The look yeah, on maybe. Everett McGill's face is so awesome throughout this scene. <laughs> yes. Are you in our class at school? I I love Big Ed. Um, I mean, there's just something about him. There's Him and Pete are characters that I feel like on other show you would just not care about, but you just feel like they're the town of Twin Peaks to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, totally. Everybody You're that we're not seeing is probably very similar to them, yeah. My parents loved it so much. And just the look of him. I mean, he looks like a small-town mechanic. Okay mm-hmm. for me to stay over at and the amazing thing was the whole thing that... Uh, is it you know, David Lynch really fought to have Everett McGill on the show because ABC was apparently at the beginning saying, you know, we don't want you to cast Everett McGill. And they were saying he doesn't have the right look, and David Lynch was saying, no way. He stood up for him, and it's so good that he did because Everett is great. I couldn't imagine anybody else doing it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's part of the problem with network television. They want everyone to look like a supermodel, and then it's not believable. Right. And these people look like real people in small towns. I mean, I love Big Ed, and it's really remarkable that they can make him so likable and lovable because he's basically committing adultery throughout the whole series. <laughs> and, you're rooting, yeah, that's true. and you're rooting for him to do it. <laughs> yeah, you want, him to get, you want him to get away with it and end up with uh, the person he's committing adultery with. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this. I feel like I might have said this last time, but for me, I do not want in season three of Twin Peaks Big Ed and Norma to still be longing for each other because it was 20 years at this point and it's been 25 years no man longs for someone for 45 years no I think that's, that's too long I think they're probably going to be together and Nadine is going to be like their worst nightmare I don't have any sympathy for Ed and Nadine and Norma if they're still wanting to get together at this point right yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean that would be a long time yeah I'm I sure. mean like, wouldn't that make sense? Like, they'd be together, but Nadine's still around, and she just tries to make their life a living hell just as much as she can. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I can take Josh's silence as, as knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Conspicuously so. <laughs> That's the look I love from Big yeah. Ed. Oh, yeah, this is priceless. Oh, boy, Nadine. <laughs> Classic line. <laughs> Sure. This this scene drags on so painfully long. It's just a it's signature Lynch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shelly. You see, I mean, there's hardly any Cooper in this episode. I just, I, I mean, I'm sure that Mark Frost could care less about ratings at this point. But I would. It's just a very interesting choice to do this on an episode that you knew. And I think it does have a rating spike, but... I like that they brought Mike back here. Like, he hasn't been seen in a while at this point. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, it hey, seems this... like what kind of what they did in the last episode where they're bringing back right other townsfolk who were in the pilot. Leo. Mike yeah. and Bobby are so good with each other. I, I hope that they get a few scenes in this upcoming season together. You just think how happy Catherine is that she gets to witness this. <laughs> I know. And she knows he's innocent. Let's this see has if she's to smiling. be the best day of her of her life here. I can't. Oh, yeah. No! Can't tell if she's smiling. No! <sighs> you... Oh, she's staying in character. I cannot wait to find out what Ben Horn is up to 25 years later. Is he is he still yeah. good or is he evil again? Oh, he's evil. <laughs> I got it. He'd have to be. He'd have to be. Because he was never good. I mean, even when he was good, he was evil. <laughs> As Sylvia said, what are you trying to do to this family? Catherine's like, mother fu- <laughs> <laughs> Rifle through his drawers. Ah, uh, here we go. The fuse is lit. Mm-hmm. Yep. Just, so I remember being just devastatedly sad that it was Leland. I didn't want it to be Leland. You knew after last week that the killer had to be one of three people. It was either Leland, Pete, or Ben. Mm-hmm. 
because of what the one-armed man says. So I just did not want it to be Leland. I guess for me, I, I still was of the thought Bob could be real and he wasn't necessarily this metaphysical being. So I, I still didn't really know what to think at this point. Yeah, I remember thinking Bob might be some yeah, kind of real thing also. Would a, a, would a record player ever actually make this specific noise? Yeah, it would. Yeah? It would. It would be interesting to see if you could get it to do that. Mm, it's a great noise. I don't actually have a record player. So I'm gonna be yeah. oh, I have several. So I recently it's just got Firewalk with Me and Twin Peaks on yeah. vinyl, and I listen to them daily. It's phenomenal. Nice. And does the record player do that if you let it go past the end? Well, certain ones will. It depends how they're set up. That should be a track on the record. <laughs> yeah. Now here's an inspired shot. This like, is like, apparently... that's wonderful. This is apparently different from the script right here. Cause I remember seeing it in Joel Baco on set when they were filming, and David Lynch Simon said, "You know, we got to put you in the scene." <laughs> Good. Call. And uh, had the idea to have him there, and then just have him be really sad and near tears, you know, at the end of this. And it just it's so it really makes it. It's so amazing. And it was just because Dana happened to stop by the set. Mm-hmm. I like to think it has something to do with the major. And that he's connected to the major, which is connected to the the Black Lodge or the White oh, you're Lodge. You're talking about in the context as opposed to in real life. Yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, I like you. you. You know. Here we go. The scariest moment I, of oh, television God. I've ever seen. Oh God, this is still scary. It's still scary. It never stops being scary. <laughs> How incredible is Ray Wise? Oh, uh, just amazing. there it is. Yeah, and Frank I mean. Silva, he's he doesn't have to say anything, but he's great. I love how Leland walks away from the mirror, and you see Bob in the image, still there, even when he's almost out of, you know, the mm-hmm. view of the mirror. You still see yep. it. Yeah. And then you know what can you say about Cheryl Lee? I can't imagine what this day was like for her. You know, we talked about actors getting screwed out of awards. I mean, the physicality of shooting this scene three times is amazing. How they how they do the uh, the Bob in the mirror thing? Is it actually a hole in the wall, and there's a duplicate set on the other side, or is it special effects? Duplicate set. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they would have really had the effects at that point. I would think. Yeah, that was before they really could. Well, how about this, Josh? Um, when they say they filmed it three times, did they leave the camera right where it is right here and film it three times in a row? Were all three actors on there? Or did they do it all with Leland, then do it again all with Ben, and then all with Frank? I believe they jumped up. Uh, they did each shot with all three of them. Because, I mean, with the fade, you'd think, yeah, you'd think they'd have to lock the camera. Because the fades exactly. are perfect. They would lock the camera, they would do a shot, and have all three of them do it, and then, yeah. That is one of the creepiest things, Bob telling her to, you know, bring it. It's, mm-hmm. God, that is disturbing. Yes, it is. It's in the sound. And, you know, there's no nudity here. There's no bad language. But this should not be on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, this is truly the most disturbing thing. And probably no one cared. No one said a word about it. Because it oh, was a man true. beating a woman. That too was unbelievably horrifying. Yeah. The hit from the couch is oh my God. <laughs> I remember Grace saying that she kept getting stepped on accidentally by crew members this day. <laughs> so, Brad, did you talk to Ray about filming this scene? Did he, did he talk yeah. about the emotional yeah, mindset? Yeah, I mean, just over the phone, just hearing his voice and the tone, I mean, it was, it was almost a matter of life and death you could hear. Uh, I mean, it was really tough for him. And uh, I... I know it, him and Cheryl are still really close. They've always been close, and I think there was a lot of struggle to to do this. Mm. Is this all Bob, you guys think, or is some of it Leland? When he said, my baby and stuff, he's kind of crying and holding her. 
I think Leland is always aware at some point of what he's doing, some part of him. This is just disturbing. The slow mo just takes it over the over the top. I mean, can you imagine the ABC <laughs> sensors when <laughs> when this came across? Maybe they somehow, never sent it to him. I think somehow it got. I, I always wonder that. I try to picture the ABC executives watching the final episode too. Is always a funny image. <laughs> do you know? Do you know if they got any notes? <laughs> I don't know, but I know that everyone would have ignored them if they did. <laughs> well, I'm sure they just didn't understand, especially the final episode. They probably didn't care, and they were like, this is trash, and no one will ever appreciate this, and mm-hmm. I'm sure that's what they thought. And how long I think they, they did cancel yeah. it right after they viewed it. Uh, I think if you look at the timing, it was pretty much the end once they saw that. So here I'd like to submit that uh, Josh and I came up with a theory that um, it is actually Leland who comes up with the um, under the fingernail thing. Yeah? Yes. Why, why, why do you think that? Uh, because we think that Bob would really not care. Yeah. Bob would not be interested in doing this. This is Leland telling people who's doing it. Yeah. Exactly. See, I sense. think I, I disagree. I think Bob wants to send a message out into the world and and tell them who he is yeah it could go either way i guess if somebody gets to interview david lynch ask him which which it is (laughs) i'm sure he'll answer it (laughs) i think bob Bob and cooper are connected somehow and he loves messing with cooper whenever he gets the chance Hmm. fun we may get the answer in season three you never know you don't and again, for acting, I mean, Kyle MacLachlan, he doesn't have a line, and a true actor doesn't need one. I mean, everything exactly. is right there on his face. Yeah, you can just see him trying to put the puzzle pieces together. You can read it on his yeah, face. Yeah, great job there in that post, absolutely. Twin Peaks, for me, at least the television series, is never the same after this moment. Um, there's just something that changes, and the energy is different. I don't know how to explain it, but mm-hmm. for me, this is the end of of the original Twin Peaks. I don't know. I would say that I would agree with you maybe if you were saying the end of 16, but I think 15 and 16 hold it still. Yeah, I I like them quite a bit. And of course, in the final episode, it's just a masterpiece. That's... That's as... So what does she know? What do you think the log lady knows right there? Did she see the giant? Yes, she definitely did. You can see that... You can see when the giant appears that she's very aware What's up with Bobby? And uh, I said, they're feeling they're feeling the sadness of it. It's uh, it's similar. You don't to know. <laughs> and as, James don't know. And as usual, yeah, James is just a dumb dumb. Yeah, he is not James clued in to the the vibe here. <laughs> but it's almost a callback to the pilot when Donna's aware that you know about Laura and. Uh, yeah, except that that time there was clues, and this time that comes out of nowhere. But I still I still love this, even though it, there's so no what do you, explanation. I'm curious what Lynch told Laura Flynn Boyle there, because they don't know the rest of the script. I mean, I, I I'm curious. Yeah, what people knew about, here. See, the thing about it is, you can give it two explanations. She feels the vibe of Maddie, or she's crying about Harold. So you have, you know. The, two, the more supernatural explanation and the also real world explanation with that mm-hmm. with Donna at least mm-hmm. right yeah with Donna I just wonder what Lynch told her and then I love that you see the red curtains you know to all of us now we know what the red curtains mean but the first time I saw this episode I was like that's his dream like it's connecting exactly. to the dream like that's the first time we've seen the curtains since episode 2 true yeah and then you get the different end, end slide. Yep. Yeah, I always wonder if Lynch... I don't think he really knew where the series was going after this, but I wonder if he wanted to end Twin Peaks with Cooper in that red room. Uh, yeah. and if he was foreshadowing that or if it was just coincidence. Maybe. There's a little bit of a crossfade in this shot. Like, you can see the curtain running down the middle of his face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's an interesting theory that it's a... Uh, it's foreshadowing, but I have a feeling Lynch just loved how it looked and said, put that on at the end of credits. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
propaganda so, films. What was that? It was the original production house that did the first season. Um, I think a couple of two Icelanders actually may have started it, okay. if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. Well, yeah, that one was one of the greats. <laughs> yes, it, definitely. It really is, but I'm going to say something to be unpopular. And after sitting here and watching this and going through them with you, I'm going to say that's the worst directed Lynch episode of Twin Peaks. And fight me. <laughs> on, a, on, a tec- on a technical level, you mean? Just, yeah, for shots. I mean, there's nothing you can say about that end shot. It's uh, the end scene with him. I mean, it's beautiful. It's scary. It's the scariest thing. But taking it as a full episode, and if I had to rank the pilot, episode 2, um, 8, 9, 14, and um, 29, I don't think I'm missing any, I would put that as, as his worst episode. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, I know you want to fight me. Come well, on, I mean, let's go. What, what would you choose? Well, opinion, you know, I can't, how can I fight somebody's opinion? <laughs> well, which, oh, because this is a podcast, that's what we do. Uh, okay. I mean, the the I might agree. The sheer power of it. The sheer power of it is uh, stops it from being his worst. The the the, the amount of power of that ending is yeah, so the, strong. The ending is undeniably like a masterpiece of atmosphere and mood. The only thing that eclipses that is the finale. I mean, I kind of go back and forth with this episode and the last as my favorite. Me, so me too. I, I would, I completely disagree with you, Scott. Okay. So, Thank you. so, so what would you guys <laughs> I, I, say? I would be Brad on that one. I got I, I'm going with Brad on that one too. This one on the finale are my two, my two favorites. Interesting. Cause mine would be, um, so would you say the pilot is the worst one then? I mean, okay. see, I'm gonna. I, I, you guys don't like worst. I know. I've, I'm painting everyone into an awful place. Really are, cause the worst David Lynch direct, directed episode. It's like saying, "What's the worst piece of gold?" And you're yeah. right. It's it's and true. All, I think that, and this is just my opinion. I feel like the first two episodes of season two are his weakest. I love the giant sequence when he visits Cooper, but after that, I kind of feel like the beginning of the second season could have been better. Um, so those are kind of my my least favorite Lynch episodes. Hmm. And, and I would say my I, mean, I think we all agree. I think that twenty nine is his best episode, right? Probably, Probably yeah. Yes, yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's it's it, I mean, it's just it's amazing. Um, I actually would pick episode nine as my second favorite. Hmm. I just love episode nine, but. Got one of the most terrifying moments in it, for sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. And every scene has something interesting. I just don't know that he brought something to the Bobby scenes um, or the Norma and Shelley scenes. And again, I love Lynch. I know we're not supposed to say negative things, but (laughs) I never thought of it until I was just sitting here watching it. And we were all kind of quiet in a lot of the scenes. I don't feel like we were in the other ones. Maybe we've used up all our stories. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel. Don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think we've used up all our stories by a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. well, episode two. I mean, we ha- we barely touched on that with the the first red room dream. I mean, I love that episode. I love Ben and Jerry at One Eyed Jacks. There's a lot of great stuff yeah. in that episode. The rock throw. That's yeah. the first episode I saw. Was that well, episode when it aired? Really, that was your first one. I walked in on it. I was a, uh, I was a little kid, and I walked in on it, and my parents were watching it. And uh, I think one, the first scene I saw was Ben and Jerry going to One Eye Jacks, hmm. uh, hopping in the boat. Actually, the let's hop in the boat was the very first thing I ever saw, and I just got increasingly caught up in it. I was a little kid, and I just, Do you know I was what, amazed. I said, "Do you know what drew you into that scene? Like, why, why wouldn't you have just kept walking?" I don't know. It just it drew me in, and then I kept watching it. And then I remember the scene with Leo and Mike and uh, Bobby in the woods. And just one scene after another, I remember just asking my parents, just saying, "This is the most." Am- I was just drawn in by the atmosphere, by everything, the mystery of it. I remember just asking my parents, saying, "This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I want you to tell me everything about this. This is incredible." Mm. And from that moment on, I found somebody that had the first two, you know, the pilot and the next and episode one on tape. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to catch up that way because it was in you know, VHS days and. The rest is history. <laughs> changed my life. Yeah, and changed all of ours. I'm glad you, <laughs> I'm glad you did it. Um, the scene that I would mention in episode two 
is the opening credits of that where the horns are sitting there eating dinner and not saying <laughs> one word. And one shot again, too. Another oh, one do I love Lynch opening with one shot. Similar to the episode 14 opening with that single shot. Yeah, and just just so inspired. You're not supposed to be quiet on television. There's no way someone at ABC said, where's the dialogue for this scene? <laughs> yes. It's like, it's there. You you can hear it loud and clear. Yeah, it's just- I was I watching uh, w- yeah. one of the USC panels that uh, happened in 2013, and there's this ABC executive named Phil Siegel, and he was uh, describing <laughs> the feeling in the room when the banker, uh, M- Del Mibler, walks across <laughs> the bank. And it's like, I don't know how long it takes, but he said the executives were just dying. He was like... <laughs> and, and I think Twin Peaks was canceled basically the next day. Huh. Yeah. Sad. I think I'm very told the story at UFC, too, about, uh, about an episode with them and thinking, okay, that's it's over. <laughs> but again, that's so short-sighted because to me, him walking is a bookend to the old man coming in and out in episode eight. So Lynch put a frame around season two. And it's yeah. just funny. They just can't see art. I mean, that's so artistic. I wonder how yeah. many of those same executives have come to appreciate it later. Yeah. If, any, if well, any. well, one of the executives that was there the whole time, uh, is actually at Showtime and brought them in, Gary Levine. So you got to give him some credit. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for joining me once again. It's been quite a Absolutely. while, but we got to space these out before the you know the next uh, season starts. So I can't do them all That's at once. True. Let's so do I the finale when we know uh, a premiere date for Showtime. <laughs> the, fina- the finale of the you- show? Uh, well, I guess I say finale, the second season finale. Or do you just want to do our last commentary when we know the... Like, because we, we thought about doing the movie and stuff too, right? Didn't we? Yeah, because what about Fire Walk with me? That's Lynch directed. Well, right. and what I... I, would, I wouldn't... I would I'd like to do episode 16. I mean, I know that it's not Lynch, but man, I think there's some great shots on there. That's what that would be my... Yeah, art. yeah I mean, we can. And if you guys uh, are up for it, we can definitely do but that. I'd be up for it. Mm-hmm. I'd be up sure, for it. Sure, totally. Just... Just because, to me, they really do go together, and and going back to Brad's Twin Peaks changes, mm-hmm. think, oh wow, my Brad, a picture of you and me just showed up on my computer of you stabbing me like Winter Merle in the Red Room from the Fast. <laughs> <laughs> it just kicked into my screensaver, and Brad just stabbed me. I'm going to say Brad doesn't want to do 16. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it- it would have been interesting to see, I mean, I love episode 16, but it would have been interesting to see how Lynch would have approached that. Mm-hmm. Or episode 17. I really feel like that was the last chance for the show to survive back in the day. And if you watch it, it really doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. I wonder. Yeah. That actually is a how, great... Gonna... That's a really great thought. What if Lynch directed 17? I have never thought of that in my life. Good, Good thought, Brad. One thought that I've always had is I wondered how he would have directed if he had directed eighteen. I always wondered how he would have directed Evelyn Marsh. I wondered that what he would have done with Evelyn Marsh with that storyline. He actually cast McCarthy as Evelyn himself. Uh, so that is a great question. But did he have anything to do with the yeah. inception of the storyline? No, that was Harley Payton. But um, that's a good question. Those are those are some of the great mysteries of the second season. A lot of foggy memories Barry, that are tough to, to figure out. I always thought Barry Pullman might have had something to do with it also. Hmm. Considering that he wrote the first one where it, where it starts. Yeah. I but actually... Ever... I don't know how we got to James and Evelyn from uh, what we just saw five minutes ago. Yeah. But <laughs> those first few scenes were pretty good. I, I thought the dialogue was really snappy and and a lot of fun yeah i just didn't like how we were outside of twin peaks and i'm not gonna like that in season three either i'm sure well we'll see yeah because you you wouldn't say fire walk me right right Mm, yeah i suppose Uh, but that still has a very it's still a small town i don't know i guess wherever they were in the uh james and uh and little James' side story was kind of small townish too, I guess. But oh well, no, not really, because they were in a mansion. <laughs> yeah. 
opera. Well, it's just a soap. I mean, that's the difference. Yeah. It's the idea of being a soap opera and not. I mean, Twin Peaks is not a soap opera to me, even though it might be spoofing one. Yeah. It just becomes one, like, full on in partway through season two. I don't mean this in a bad way, but I kind of feel like whenever Catherine is on the screen, I always am reminded of Joan Collins in Dynasty. So it, <laughs> right? it does feel like one of those knots landing or falcon crest series to me at at certain points yeah she 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 looks and sort of acts like a like a soap character sometimes yeah Hmm. all right well uh yeah thanks for joining me and we'll be back next time uh we might do 16 uh you'll find out when we do it uh (laughs) uh josh uh you got anything to tell the people about um, nothing really that much new since last time. Okay, just they, they should go to the Twin Peaks Fest. <laughs> Do I think they should? Oh, absolutely, but it's uh, not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, now it sells out in ten hours. So yeah, that's crazy. Um, I may, right. I may have some, oh. I may have some news coming up soon, but nothing I can really talk about oh, yet. Oh, really? Exciting. Yeah, I definitely will, but I can't talk about it yet. Cool. All right, uh, Brad, what about you? Not regarding Twin Peaks, but I was <laughs> That's fine. Um, my podcast, The Brad Dukes Show, has had a little bit of a summer vacation, but I've got some really, really fun chats lined up in the next week, and episodes will be kicking off uh, very soon after. So stay tuned. And they can find me on Twitter at Brad underscore D underscore. Cool. And Scott? I am found at R- Bedroom Podcast on Twitter, and you can go out to Amazon.com and screen my documentary, A Voyage to Twin Peaks, which is about the 25th Twin Peaks festival that actually all of us are in in one way or another. So it's actually streaming on Amazon now. Awesome. Nice. Cool. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, is it, will there ever be a sequel? <laughs> Um, I don't know. I doubt there would ever be a sequel, but I'm always cooking up something else. So I, I, I've got a couple of things planned. So I'm sure you'll just make like a home movie for yourself out of this year's fest or something. Actually, I'm kind of hoping this year to not film because last year I was really focused on filming, and this year I'm going with a little bit of a, a more of a low key. Yeah, just want to just want to experience it. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, uh, thanks everyone again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. See ya. All right. Bye. Absolute. Bye. Absolute. Bye. Absolute. Bye. Absolute. Bye. Absolute. Bye. Absolute.